Hi, everyone. This is going to be an episode entitled, Why Does the Python Priestess of Phil uh, Philippi Serving Apollo in Acts 16, verse 16, Endorse Paul's Way of Salvation Days Before Paul Casts Out a Demon from Her? And the reason I'm going to, we've dealt many times with this before, but uh, Mr. Bertram, uh, I won't give you his last name, November 27th, that was uh, two days ago, uh, wrote me in the morning. Uh, you're taking your bias against Paul and your belief that he is false and reading that back into the text. So I'm reading the text, which has a demon, uh, demon possessed woman, very popular, very uh, persuasive person. Armies are launched <laughs> to war based on what the Delphic Oracle and then the Philippi Oracle is his, her sister companion in Macedonia. And that's who Paul is meaning. Th these, these Delphic Oracles or these Oracles of Apollo, they're persuasive. They lead people going in the direction they speak. And, uh, and I'm saying, why would a demon possessed woman do that? <laughs> would she, that serves her God, Apollo to have Paul go in that direction. Okay. So he's saying that I'm taking a bias. I'm biased that that's, uh, that she's telling the truth from her perspective, still possessed by a demon that it's Paul, Paul is teaching a way of salvation of the most high God. And you need to know in the Delphic Oracle and the Philippi Oracle, they're both serving Apollo. That's the most high God. And the son of God there is higher than God Zeus in terms of preeminence. And so that was who she was saying to follow. She She's a follower of Apollo herself. So he's saying, it's my bias that leads me to conclude that she's endorsing him from a demonic perspective, she's endorsing it while she's still possessed by a demon. Why? And so I, I find it hard to understand why he even thinks there's a doubt about that, but we're going to go through it here. And I'm going to show you his argument right now. He says this, uh, you're assuming that it has to be that an evil spirit is endorsing Paul to get people to follow his false way of salvation. I didn't say false way of salvation, endorse his way of salvation, which is pleasing to the de demons and Apollo. That's all I said. He's adding words to my words without me even considering that it just could have been true that Paul really was teaching the way of salvation. So he thinks a demon that is super popular is going to use her influence to have uh, a her enemies of her God Apollo that would be Christ the true Christ and Yahweh the, they're gonna she's gonna endorse that her followers while she's still possessed and controlled by a demon to follow Paul's uh, way of salvation and and it's not something that is inconsistent she he believes it's Paul is teaching a way that Yahweh teaches, that Jesus teaches. We all know that's not true, but that's what he thinks. And so he's saying, it's possible, Doug, she could have been endorsing Yahweh's way of salvation through Paul. The answer is no, <laughs> as it's uh, it's too obvious, but I, we're, we're going to take this, I'm going to break it down, and we're going to show that's not possible. Okay, so let's go take a look at the verses that we're talking about. This is uh, Paul arrives at Philippi in Macedonia. Okay, and here is the second center of what's called the oracle. And she's an oracle for church, for a uh, temple of Apollo in each of these cities. Delphi is one in Greece, and the other one is in Philippi. And the one in Philippi was uh, moved there. A, a Python priestess was bribed basically to leave Delphi and move to uh, uh, Philippi. And then from there, the the sect or cult of Apollo grew again in another location. And it had the same function where this woman with priest assistance would uh, writhe on the ground. Uh, her body would go into a torturous ecstasy and she would then utter mumbling glossalia. And then the priest could interpret it and then deliver that message to a patron who would pay money to her and a very financially beneficial system of money going to this python priestess nobody ever knew her real name and she was changed out with obviously people over centuries because they this has been going on for hundreds of years and it's since it's an institution of macedonia and of greece so this is what paul is going to encounter verse 12 of Acts 16 thence also to philippi so they went to philippi which is a principal city of the part of macedonia a colony and we were in this city abiding certain days 
Verse 16, and it came to pass in our going on to prayer, a certain maid having a spirit of Python, the Python priestess, that's what she's called, did meet us who brought much employment to her masters by soothsaying of the future. Uh, she having followed Paul and us was crying, saying, these men are servants of the most high God who declared to us a way of salvation. And here is um, a commentary by a church called Berean Bible Church about this verse, verse 16 of Acts 16. And by the way, you can only see that in the Young's Literal. The only one who reveals the word is Python. So a Python spirit referred to a spirit that enabled someone to predict the future. Such people generally spoke with the mouth closed, uttering words completely out of their control. So that's why I call it glossalia. That's exactly what glossalia is. Nobody can understand it. It's gibberish to everybody else. But if you have a priest nearby who can translate it, then you can have that message convey to people who want to hear her inspired voices, a voice, but she's inspired by demons, not by God Yahweh. Now, before I read you the answer I gave uh, Bertram, I want to show you what uh, Oregon, a famous theologian of the early church in the early 200s said. Uh, now I'm going to ask the question. I'm going to, a sub question. I'm asking is, was she telling the truth about Paul in relation to her God Apollo? So, from her perspective, why would she tell the truth from the perspective of Paul? Why wouldn't she be doing it from the God she serves, Apollo? She's a pagan. She worships him. She's the priestess of them. She is respected and revered all over Europe for what she says and her messages, although delivered in Glossalia. The priest always interprets them and comes out with a translation and says, this is what she actually said. People pay lots of money for it. Armies are launched based on what she says. Wars are ended if she says to stop a war. I mean, this is an institution that is well known for hundreds and hundreds of years in Greece from the six, uh, 600s. Well, let me read you what a theologian from Christianity named Oregon said in two, about 220 AD. And he's debating with a guy, Kelsus, Kelsum, who wants him, that is, Oregon, to agree that the Python priest is speaking with the divine spirit. And and what uh, Oregon is essentially going to say, the divine spirit is God's spirit, Yahweh's spirit. And no, she isn't. She's speaking with the voice of demons. And so this would be the normative understanding one would have listening to this passage of even the book of Acts. And people don't understand, again, I'm going to repeat, this book of Acts is not meant for Christians. This was meant to win an appeal by writing the story of Paul that would appeal to a most excellent Theophilus, a guy who's an assistant magistrate judge who is going to make a decision or recommendation to Nero in the pending appeal. We all forget the book of Acts ends with Paul awaiting an appeal before Caesar Nero, a pagan. And his assistant, the most excellent Theophilus, is himself going to likely be a pagan. He's a magistrate judge. He's not going to be a Jewish person. And the whole objective is the book of Acts is volume one, book of, excuse me, a book of Acts, uh, Luke is gospel. That's volume one. And volume two is the book of Acts. And you'll find things like this. This was not meant to make uh, Christians like Paul. This was, this story, I believe is totally true. And it's highlighted because this would tell pagans like Nero and, and uh, Theophilus, that, hey, Paul is in with a goddess, excuse me, not a goddess, a, uh, a priestess to the high, God, most high God, Apollo. That's in this religion. He's the most high God. He's higher than the God who sired him, and that's Zeus. So Apollo is even higher than Zeus. Now let's listen to what the uh, dialogue is. Celsus, he's the pagan who wants to endorse the, high, the pagan high, python priestess. Celsus goes on to say of us, so this is Oregon recording uh, what Kelsus has said to him. They set no value in the oracles of the Pythian priestess, whose marvelous sayings are unchangeably true. Book 7, chapter 3. Continuing in the same book, same chapter. Oregon's reply. Let us see if, after all, we cannot convince any sincere inquirers that there is no necessity to attribute these irregular responses to any divinities, but that, on the other hand, they may be traced to wicked demons. So he's saying it's not god it's not anything connected to god no divinity that we could respect but instead it's connected to demons to spirits which are in enmity with the human race and which in this way wish to hinder the soul from rising upwards from following the path of virtue and from returning to god in sincere piety pause 
So Bertram is saying, my attributing her endorsement of Paul's way of salvation to the Most High God, which to her was Apollo, I should consider it more possible that she was actually saying the truth, that it was <laughs> the truth that he, Bertram, would like it to be, which is that he meant she meant Yahweh. No, that's not true, Bertram. And an objective person, a person who's a leading theologian of Christianity is endorsing what I said. She is speaking from her perspective. She's under the control of demons. No doubt about it, because days later, Paul gets grieved by what she's doing. Probably he's wondering, people are probably wondering, who is Paul if this this, God, this uh, goddess, excuse me, not goddess, this priestess of Apollo is endorsing him? I think People who are uh, Christians that are hanging around Paul are going to go, hey, what is going on here? Why is she endorsing him? And and then all the pagans are uh, attracted to Paul, thinking that they're going to learn the message of the Most High God, which to her was Apollo. And and what we've shown in the prior episode in the last one on the uh, evidence that Paul is an Herodian is that actually his message in Colossians 1 verses 15 to 18 is exactly the doctrine of the God Zeus and Apollo at this particular cult of of uh, that's headquartered at Delphi, but its subsidiary location is Philippi. They have a very different and unique view of Apollo being the creator of heaven and earth, but yet he's a son of God Zeus. And that means when Paul says there's a God who uh, exists, a, a, an invisible God, he says, and then he says there's a second firstborn a prototokos, first childbirth of Jesus. And that Jesus then creates all things that exactly matches Apollo of this particular cult. And how do we know? Because we have an eyewitness, which is Plutarch writing in his book on the letter E at Delphi, explaining what I just told you that, that Apollo is the God who is the creator. He's also the destroyer. He has two roles. and uh, But he creates all things, living things, and, but in the process of doing that, you have to destroy certain things to reform them into life and earth and planet earth and all that. So he's both a giver of life and the destroyer of life. And so he has both meanings of the name Apollo. And uh, so that's what we learned last time. And that means that Paul's teaching in Colossians 1 verse 15 to 18 exactly matches the teachings of the cult of Apollo at Delphi and obviously at its subsidiary in Philippi, where Paul is traveling in this trip. Let's continue. So he says, let us see if after all, we cannot convince any sincere inquirers that there is no necessity to attribute these oracular responses to any divinities, but that on the other hand, they may be traced to wicked demons, to spirits which are at enmity with the human race and which in this way wish to hinder the soul from rising upwards, from following the path of virtue and from returning to God in sincere piety. It is said of the Pythian priestess, whose oracle seems to have been the most celebrated, that when she sat down at the mouth of the Castalian cave, the prophetic spirit of Apollo entered her, and when she was filled with it, she gave utterance to responses which are regarded with awe as divine truths. Argument's reply continues. Often she was believed to receive inspiration from Apollo, but it is not the part of a divine spirit to drive the prophetess into such a state of ecstasy and madness that she loses control of herself. Pause. I'm going to pause there. So what he's saying is, if you're going to say what she's doing is not by demons, but instead by divinities, by true God, then why is she uh, speaking garbledygook? Why does she speak glossalia? Why does she speak in what we now call tongues in Protestantism that follows the Pauline version of tongues. Remember, in the book Acts, tongues was not the idea that you would speak in gibberish that nobody could understand. The whole point was the apostles could speak in their language of Aramaic and Hebrew, and all these people coming for Passover were speaking other languages like Greek and other dialects, and they couldn't understand each other uh, normally. But when they spoke, the P -E, it says, Luke could not be more clear that each person heard the apostles speaking in their own tongues, meaning the recipient's own tongue. If you were from uh, Rome, you would hear it in Latin. If you were from Greece, you would hear it in Greece. If you were from maybe as, as far away as Germany, you might hear it in German dialects. Okay, So that's what it meant. The gift of tongues was the hearer would hear it in their own tongue, but it was completely intelligible. The words spoke were intelligible and the words heard were intelligible. That was the true gift of tongues in Acts 1. But Paul is teaching about a totally different kind of Acts that 
People say things that cannot be understood at all by anyone and even says, don't do this unless there's someone there to interpret, to serve the role exactly of what Plutarch de- did with his Python priestess. He would be the translator and he would write it down and translate what the gibberish meant, what the glossalia meant, what the tongues, what Pauline Christians call tongues, they called her ecstasy. And ecstasy is a pagan way to communicate with God where you lose control of your limbs. And that's what she did. You see this picture of her? She would be sit on this tripod, and eventually she would end up rolling around on the ground, and the she would gibber, have gibberish, glossalia, whatever you want to call it, tongues, I, I think is a perfect synonym for what she's doing. The Christians call it today tongues, and she is gibberishing, and nobody can understand her except the priest. And Paul said, don't let anyone do that unless a, a person is there present who can translate what she's saying. Same thing. He's experiencing and continuing this practice of her in his congregations. And I digress. Now, so so what Oregon is saying is this cannot be from God because the divine spirit, but it is not the part of a divine spirit to drive the prophetess into such a state of ecstasy and madness that she loses control of herself. So ecstasy means you're writhing on the ground. You have no control over your body functions. You're just, your legs and arms are going crazy. Just like you see in some of these, and I personally witnessed this myself. You know, I was, I, when I was in Costa Rica, I went to a particular church where I saw some of this happening. I was disturbed when I saw it. And I told that to the leadership and they got upset with me. And uh, that made me research at the time. So I, God's always prepared me to see things later, but I didn't understand it completely. But I also had the same conclusion. How could be being out of your mind, losing control of yourself, having words coming out of your mouth that you don't understand and somebody else has to interpret it. How can that be from God? I just, I intuitively didn't believe it was possible. Let's read. For he who is under the influence of the divine spirit, Oregon, good, solid Christian, famous Christian, ought to be the first to receive the beneficial effects. And these ought not to be first enjoyed by the persons who consult the oracle about the concerns of natural or civil life or purposes of temporal gain or interest. And moreover, that should be the time of clearest perception when a person is in close intercourse with the deity. So that's exactly right. And he goes on and tells you the prophets of Jerusalem and of Israel, they never had this kind of ecstasy and losing control of their minds and not be able to understand what they're saying and somebody else has to translate it. Forget it. So that's why you know it's not from God. What she's going through and saying, you know, when she when she's on the ground, writhing on the ground, that's not from God. That's not from God. Now, he's saying, how do I know this is not from God? Okay, so I'm going to give you my answer to him that what she said about Paul cannot be from God. Okay, so I'm going to prove to you what she said is not from God. Moreover, being demon-possessed and being a very influential demon, I'm going to prove to you in this uh, letter here I wrote back to Bertram, why it, uh, you cannot deduce that she's speaking for Yahweh, okay? Or t- telling the truth, that, uh, telling us that Paul is good to follow because he's following Yahweh, because that's the true way. Do you think really a demon possessed person is going to do that who has all this power and influence about around Europe? Her oracles became daily news. You know how we we go on Facebook and we try to get the latest news. She was the latest news. She was the most exciting thing that was happening at all at all times in Europe for centuries. So let's go on here. Here's Bertram. You say, I write Bertram. You're taking your, this is quoting him. You say, you're taking your bias against Paul and your belief that he is false and reading that back into the text and assuming that it has to be that the evil spirit is endorsing Paul to get people to follow his false way of salvation without even considering that it just could have been true that Paul really was teaching the way of salvation. So he's saying what she's saying is really true. That in the sense that if you assume she's talking about Yahweh, that she was saying Paul is teaching the true way of salvation of Yahweh. Why and now, so really, you have to ask yourself: Why would a demon-controlled woman who serves Apollo say that? Because people, she knows people are going to follow that, and her god that she follows and is serving is Apollo, and he's the he's a very top dog type uh, divinity in their pagan religion. Let's read what I say. Okay. So then I, I say to Bertram, but we know that Paul does not teach, in fact, the true way of salvation, but a doctrine that contradicts Jesus' view that a believer who is ensnared in fleshly sin is no longer saved, but instead must cut the body parts 
off, ensnaring them in sin, and go to heaven maimed, or otherwise they will go to hell whole. Mark 9, verses 42 to 47. So this is a passage that most of, most of you Pauline Christians never can contemplate, but Jesus said, a believer in me who's ensnared in sin has two choices. You can go to heaven maimed or hell whole. He doesn't give you an option of just believing him and the facts that he died, buried, and was resurrected, and you're going to go to heaven. He expects repentance, he expects re reform, or you're not going there. And you just what you are told to lie every single Sunday. You're told it's what Paul teaches you, and you're never aware that it's all a lie. What Paul teaches you is false, not a way of salvation of the true high God. So now she cannot possibly have meant that literally about Yahweh, about Paul, in, in, in any in any respect. So she she doesn't believe in Yahweh, so she, she would not, wouldn't endorse him anyway because he's at least has some minimal connection to Yahweh. But on the other hand, she's going to want to defend her position, which is she follows Apollo. So let's look at that real, more likely scenario. You see, do you not that Jesus contradicts Paul's faith alone doctrine in Romans 4, verses 3 to 4, right? So if the demon was cast down and endorsed Paul, I would naturally not agree Paul's teaching correctly because independent of such woman cleansed of a demon that her words cannot sanctify Paul's false gospel when it 100% violates Jesus' true gospel for believers in Mark 9, verses 42 to 47. And I say you'll see the same thing in John 8, 30 to 47. So in other words, let's say she was endorsing Paul's way of salvation, right? I wouldn't accept it because of her. <laughs> this is the thing that's so ironic from him is uh, if you, we know Paul is teaching a false gospel. That doesn't matter. That, I'm not assuming he's teaching a false gospel. He does teach a false gospel. He contradicts this passage over and over again. Faith alone, Romans 4, 3 to 4, you, you know, you don't have to do works. Forget about works of repentance. You just have to believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. It's not even a question, my friends. You've just been deceived because your pastors never told, tell, show you what Jesus teaches that are completely at odds with Paul. Same thing in John 8, verses 30 to 47. There's these guys who believe in Jesus. They come up to him. They, they want to say hello to him. And he says, hey, great. You started on the path. Now you have to become my disciples to be free. And they go, what do you mean free? We're, we're, we're not in bondage to anyone. And they says, Jesus says, no, when you are sinning, you're in bondage to sin. And they, just, they say, no, we've never been in bondage to anyone. So uh, we are followers. We're sons of Abraham. So we don't have to worry about anything what you're saying. And just so you know, the Pharisees told the people of uh, children of Abraham, all Israel will be saved, just like Paul says in Romans 10. That's a Pharisee doctrine that they will be predestined to be saved just by their virtue of connection to Abraham. So they're telling Jesus, we don't have to become disciples of yours. You're wasting our time. We're going to live our life the way we want. We don't have to follow your truth. We don't have to stop sinning. So they basically believe in him, but they don't want to do anything that he to, to learn and become the, his disciples. What? How do you think that ends up, my friends? Do you think Jesus is going to say, well, great, you believe in me, you're saved, faith alone, you'll be, you should go to heaven, so goodbye. No, he says, hey, now you want to kill me because I'm trying to tell you the truth. And then he says that you're the son of your father, the devil. <laughs> so they went from believers in Christ to damned to going to hell. That's the fastest you could see the, the evaporation of faith alone goes nowhere when you don't want to become Jesus' disciple and be free of sin, actual freedom from sin. So John 8 tells you that all the ways you're hearing the verse in 30 times the way it's translated in John's gospel as believe in him is not true. I show you academically, it means in Greek, obey unto him. And who agrees with me? The NIV Theological Dictionary from Zondervan, page 1027 under the entry Pistis. I have copies of it online that I always provide of the page, that page and the title page and everything. And that's been reissued four or five times. And they've even em embellished it with citations to classical uh, plays that show that's the actual meaning of the word pisto when related in direction to a person. So it always said, God so loved the world that whoever obeys unto, keeps on obeying unto him should have eternal life. Boom. It knocks... So, ladies and gentlemen, you're living in a bubble that was created by your theological translators to keep you in the dark from Jesus. Because if you learn what Jesus said, you'd have to change. And, and you're not going to come back to church if you're told you have to change. A lot of you would just go out the door and be with your itching ears, find a church that tells you you don't have to do anything. Just believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, and you shall be saved. And that's your mantra. And you're going to take it all the way to your death, and then you're going to find out it didn't work. And I, that's what I'm here for, to tell you you're on the path to hell if you don't get off this path. And here's your proof. 
a python priestess under the influence of demons is telling you that Paul teaches a way of salvation. Let's continue. And then I say to him, but here, in fact, in Acts 16, 16, the demon is still in the woman's spirit and Paul's not casted her out. She is world famous. Armies are launched on her word. Anonymous women for centuries fulfilled the python priestess role. But as Paul says, she is demon possessed. Now, what does this demon-possessed woman say? This highly influential woman whose words change the decisions of generals to fight a war in some country and can sway an entire nation as her oracles are spread like the daily news is today. Quote, And it came to pass as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination, Python and Greek, met us, which brought us her masters much gain for soothsaying. The same followed Paul and us and cried and saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days, but Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out of her the same day. So who do you think she had to mean with what, who do you think she had to mean with the demon in her is the most high God? The answer is Apollo, her master. And whose salvation is Paul teaching? I showed that recently that Colossians 1 15 to 18 is the Zeus Apollo form of deities. One is a father, the Zeus, who sires a son, Apollo, who then in turn creates the heavens and the earth and all living things, as Plutarch explains in the letter E at Delphi. That's the name of the book, by the way. It's $1.99 at Amazon, if you want to read it, written in the early 100s. Plutarch, for the prior 30 years, had up to that time, he acted as one of the two priests that deciphered her glossalia-mediated prophecies, wrote them on, for the patron, paying for her prophecies, etc. You are saying we should suppose a demon who served Satan was instead telling the truth while still possessed by the demon that Paul is supposedly indeed teaching the way of salvation for the Most High, who you think she intends to mean Yahweh instead of Apollo, who is her true ideal God. An indisputable fact. Here's an indisputable fact. Influential demons serving Satan do not tell the truth to the unsaved that helps Yahweh, especially if the public would likely be swayed in droves to now support Paul. Paul agrees. Saint, Paul says Satan's entire mode of operation is filled with deception and lies. John 8, verse 44. And that's actually from the passage I just mentioned to you about faith. It didn't work for those guys. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, 2 Thessalonians 2, 9. I'm not saying that a demon can never tell the truth, but it will never tell the truth if the public could actually be persuaded by the truth. For example, in Israel, demon-possessed people are rejected and their words are ignored. Okay, so if if, if the Python priestess was doing this in, in uh, Jerusalem around a bunch of Jews, do you think they would listen to her and believe it's the truth? Let's say she's trying to endorse Jesus. They're not going to accept that. So Jesus wouldn't want demons to endorse him inside of Israel because people are going to think he's should be he's being endorsed by demons they would jesus would know that they would interpret it as they're they're getting an endorsement he's getting endorsement he doesn't want that so what does he do he tells them to shut up so if they tell so i tell them this so if they tell the truth for example jesus is the son of god that's in luke 4 verse 41 a demon says jesus is the son of god right it is itself a deception to make people assume that the demon is lying and hence supports the listening public to deduce jesus is not the son of god so the, the fastest way for Satan to undermine Jesus is to have his demons endorse Jesus. And then if the people realize it's demons endorsing Jesus, the son of God, they're going to think, oh, my gosh, you know, Jesus is supported by demons. That's why Jesus turns around and tells them, shut up. <laughs> right. So that's the whole thing, my friends, is he's his uh, Bertram is misreading what it is for her to openly endorse Paul in an environment where they're going to be motivated to follow Paul for sure. Instead of uh, in the case where getting an endorsement in Israel is going to have the opposite effect where people will distrust the, the demon and assume if it endorses Jesus, it can't possibly be that Jesus is a true, truly from God because the demons endorse him. See what I mean? Very clever. The demons are very able to manipulate people. Uh, it's known as putting on a false face. They're hypocrites when necessary to to pretend that they are endorsing Jesus so that the people would be repulsed from following Jesus in a in a community of Jewish people from Jewish a Jewish belief system. So so they say he's the son of God in Luke 441 441 it is itself a deception to make people assume that a demon is lying and hence supports the listening to deduce Jesus is not the son of God. See? It has the opposite effect in a community that's a religious 
Judea, Ju Jewish community, but in a pagan community, a demon endorsing Paul is going to be a fantastic support to go ahead and trust Paul. So it has the opposite effect in their community. So in Israel, demons, I would expect, tell the truth about Jesus so as to deceive the listener to think demons endorse Jesus, and hence he must be controlled by demons. But the opposite is true in Greece and Macedonia, where demon-controlled spirits like the Python priestess is so esteemed that whoever she anoints will be followed by the public. It is a true national religion of Europe. The Python's endorsement is prized by emperors and statesmen throughout Europe. So if Paul were truly following the true Jesus in Greece, Philippi, the Python would never endorse Paul as speaking for the Most High God for her Apollo, because she indeed is very trusted, unlike the demons of Israel who are mistrusted and the people of Israel assume the demon is lying. Hence, this is why the Python priestess who serves Satan and is strongly trusted throughout Europe would be anxious to launch Paul's career over all of Europe by the most hearty and robust endorsement. Blessings, Doug. All right, so I think that's the answer to this problem that he was raising. Why would a demon python priestess endorsed paul and his way of salvation and he thinks it must be that she was just telling the truth that he is speaking for yahweh just like i showed you happened with jesus in in israel where the jews they'll react differently and they believe that's proof that jesus is false but in this community where this uh, woman is endorsing paul in philippi these are all pagans around and they're all thriving and they're following Paul in droves at this time. So that's the reason. And uh, Bertram is just simply saying, I have to consider, yeah, anything's possible, Bertram, if that's what you're trying to say, but it's not likely. It, the, the facts and circumstances really dictate that she is endorsing Paul because he's not teaching the true way of salvation of Yahweh, but because he's teaching the true salvation message of Apollo, and that God is reflected 100% in Colossians 1, 15 to 18. And I'll just digress and show you that to you real quick. So I'm going to read you Colossians in a second, but I want to set it up a little bit in this book on the E at Delphi. He is a enigm enigmatic instruction on the temple of Apollo at Delphi. And Plutarch is a priest who serves the python taking her glossalia and translating it on a piece of paper for the patron who pays money for her oracles. And he's going to explain the doctrine of this group. And he's going to explain the, it's the missing piece to understand Paul and where he's coming from. And uh, Apollo is the god of the sun. And he explains uh, at Delphi is the goddess of, of uh, excuse me, the python priestess. And Apollo is the one who takes fire and uh, turns and then subdivides the earth into air, water, and earth, and the production of animals and plants. And by doing this, he's also known as being a dismemberer. So you you have to destroy matter to reconstruct it into life. So it's, it's both a, a, a creation as well as pre, pre starting from a destruction or dismemberment of what was there. He's also called Dionysius, which why is, I brought it up there to show that Paul quotes the play of Di, about Dionysius called the Bacchae by Euripides. And that has the famous line, you cannot kick against the pricks, which... Paul says his Jesus, his Jesus quotes on the road to Damascus right out of the play where that is from this play where Dionysius, the God who's a, a dying and resurrecting God, he's one uh, the son of God, right? And he's dying. Now, remember, this is according to Plutarch. This is really Apollo, another name for him. He's dying. He resurrects. He comes back to life. And then he, uh, but before that happens, he's, he tells King Pentheus, uh, Better to yield him prayer, meaning himself, and sacrifice, than kick against the pricks, since Dionysius is God and thou but mortal. So Dionysius is claiming he is God. He's God the Son, the creator of all things in life. Okay, according to this sect of Apollo in this particular area, according to Plutarch's description, which I just read you. So getting back to uh, Colossians, let's take a look at Colossians. Why is this... So clearly Apollo religion right here, because you have a creator God, Jesus, the prototokos, the firstborn. He's the son of Zeus in that Apollo religion. He's the son of God in the way this is depicted, but you're not told that it's Yahweh. It's just called the invisible God. Why not say something more specific? But anyway, uh, the firstborn, but the prototokos. And then here, verse 16, twice it says, by him, all things were created. And then it says, all things were created by him. That's exactly what I just read you from the, uh, the letter, the letter 
E at Delphi by Plutarch from 100 AD. And what else is interesting is the god Apollo has superiority and preeminence over Zeus. Zeus is like a nobody. Once he creates or sires his son, Apollo, he fight, fades into the background, and now all the attention is on Apollo and his messages through his priestess. So what is what happened to Jesus? Is he going to be a subordinate son? I mean, if you read the Gospel of John, Jesus is very clear. He's inferior to God the Father. He says, you know, I can do nothing without him, and uh, basically he's not superior. But Paul makes him totally superior. He says he, the name of Christ is above all other names. He doesn't accept Yahweh from that rule. He's going to do the same thing here. Verse 18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn of the dead, and that in all things he might have the preeminence. So Jesus has to have preeminence over what? Over everything. And since he's the creator of all things, it makes sense. He created the he created all life forms. So as the father of human humanity, not God Yahweh, he has the preeminence over his people that he created. So it makes sense that he would be just like Apollo in the religion of Apollo as a son of Zeus. Apollo is superior to, uh, to superior to Zeus. So anyway, you're, we are literally witnessing in real time. Paul is serving Apollo. That's his true God, and that's why he put the words of Apollo, aka Dionysius, as that he's also known in this cult at Delphi and Philippi. That's what, why we can say for a fact in his heart, Paul does not think of Jesus as the way you think of Jesus. He knows his Jesus is identifying or revealing himself as Apollo. So Jesus is just a front man for Apollo. And so you have to see it on multiple layers. There's a mystery. Paul says there's a mystery. Yes, he'll tell you the guy says he's Jesus, but he knows the words being quoted from the play are the play. Let's go back to it here just to wrap it up. The play of the Bacchae by Euripides. This is where he is saying, ha ha, my God is speaking to me and conveying a special message to me. And that's why he told this story in Acts 26 to Festus and King Agrippa saying, and when we were fallen to earth, I heard the voice speaking to me. That's his personal say he's Jesus saying in the uh, Hebrew tongue, so, so why persecute me, you, it, you, me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And just so you know, that plural of pricks is key because the meter of that uh, play, that play by Euripides is in rhyme, what they call, um, uh, oh, it's escaping me, but it's it's a uh, meter. It's in meter. So it has to have these me rhyming conventions. And to do that, you, if you said the word prick, which would normally be the way to say this expression, it doesn't rhyme. So you have to add the letter S. So the way this was conveyed to Paul his Jesus was quoting directly from this play to identify himself to Paul and thereby derivatively to both Herod and Agrippa in this, this story and in uh, Festus, who was the judges. They understand that Jesus of Paul is conveying the idea that this is who he really is. He's Dionysius. He's Apollo. So there is a secret Apollo religion being brought to us into our church through Paul. And, that, that, and then when she's saying to him, you are speaking the words of the, uh, you're uh, endorsing, let me find it. She's telling us that Paul is a servant of the Most High God who declares us a way of salvation. She means God, Apollo, and that's what Paul is teaching. He's teaching us the Apollo religion. He is, it's right there in Acts 26, not just here in Acts 16, 16. It's in Acts 26 when Paul quotes the play of Bacchae and tells you Dionysius said, uh, excuse me, he's quoting Dionysius from a famous play, Kick Against, You Cannot Kick Against the Pricks. Therefore, Paul is identifying his Jesus, not with Jesus that you and I think of, but with Apollo, this God he, Paul, was very familiar with in his area where he grew up in Tarsus. Asia Minor is very sh th stone throw from Ephesus where uh, all this happens. And then just take a short trip across the ocean to the Aegean, not an ocean, but a, like a small... Uh, uh, inlet area, and you're on the other side, you're at Philippi, you're at Delphi, you pick, you make your pick. So he is brought up in that culture, and he is telling people who are Christians, I have a mystery. Yes, he did. It was a secret. He didn't tell everybody, but he told enough people, and he left a lot of things hanging out there. And one more thing, if you just have a second. I want to, I'm going to give you a list of the videos we have on the Python Priestess, and one of the things that I think is definitive proof as well is Paul speaks of 
speaking in tongues, which he calls glossalia, which is exactly how the Python priestess talks. First Corinthians 14, 18, Paul uh, says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. So he was more affected than most anybody else by this strange thing that should never have come out of a Christian's mouth. And now I want to read you something that should make your bones, be, uh, your, your, your skin crawl, and you, 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 go, you want to just scream. Paul describes the way you work with this person in your congregation who's speaking glossalia is identical to the way Plutarch even describes his role in relation to the high, pri the high priest, the priestess, the Python priestess. This is in 1 Corinthians 14, 1 to 5. Listen, my friends. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire gifts of the Spirit, especially prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to people but to God. Indeed, no one understands them. They utter mysteries by the Spirit. But the one who prophesies speaks the to the people for the strengthening, encouraging, and comfort. Anyone who speaks in a tongue edifies themselves, but the one who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. The one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets so that the church may be edified. So that one, unless someone interprets, that's exactly the role of the priest in the Python priestess. She speaks in tongues that are undecipherable. Nobody can understand a word she's saying. A well-known fact documented by many, many visitors who had visited her over the years and realized you can't hear anything she says. You have to wait for the priest to give you the scroll that tells you what she said. That, what is that? What is Paul doing? Identical, my friends. He has brought in the Apollo religion, paganism, and demon-controlled people, and that unfortunately is a fact. And uh, unless you speak in intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you're saying? You will just be speaking into the air. So he's insisting on if nobody's there to interpret, there's no role of the priest, the, like the Python priestess had. Don't speak in tongues because there's no one who can interpret you. You're just going to speak glossalia. So he's trying to keep it under control, but that still doesn't change what he's doing. You have to have the priest role served by somebody. So this is the religion, not of Christianity, not of Judaism, by, by the Apollo religion at Delphi and Philippi. And I want to back up what Oregon said, that when you speak in tongues, you've lost your mind. Well, listen, even Paul says the same thing in 1 Corinthians 14, 13 to 17, meaning you've lost control of your own control of your own mind. Verse 13, for this reason, the one who speaks in the tongue should pray that they may interpret what they say. So he's saying you should pray to have this role that you can even understand, Glossalia. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. There you go. His mind is not working when you're speaking in a tongue. You, he doesn't know what's going on. So you have to find somebody who knows how to interpret tongues, Glossalia, just like the Python priestess had a priest like Plutarch helping her. I'm going to play you a clip from uh, John MacArthur, and you're going to learn. This episode is called Speaking in Tongues by John MacArthur. And you're going to learn. He's telling you that this is a demonic thing, these glossalia speaking in tongues. But he doesn't try to tell you. he show you the actual passages from Paul where he is endorsing it. And yet he's saying it's demonic. So I'm not, trust me. I can't make this stuff up. I'm not I'm not fabricating this video. Wait till you see this. He's literally telling you the truth, MacArthur is, about tongues. And yet he doesn't he doesn't compute, maybe, that it's indicting Paul. Paul brought this in and he's endorsing it. And and that's why John MacArthur is gold here. Wait till you hear this passage. Who worked with them had to speak a language they did not know under divine inspiration. That was the gift of languages. We learned also that it was always a language, that it was the ability to speak a foreign language. In Acts 2, everybody understood in their own language, it says. But as we come to the Corinthian situation, incidentally, the only time that the gift is ever even mentioned after the book of Acts is in Corinth, and there, because it was so confused and chaotic. But as we come to the Corinthian situation, we find that they had counterfeited the real gift and substituted a pagan, ecstatic kind of speech. The true gift had been confused with ecstatic tongues, which was the counterfeit. Now such ecstasies and ecstatic speech 
is very common in pagan religion. And I'm not going to take the time this morning to go from one end of the world and from one end of history to the present to prove that to you. I just want you to understand that. That this is a very common thing in pagan religion. This kind of ecstatic gibberish speech. And we've discussed that in the past. But let me give you a little background on the Corinthian situation. Remember that for the most part, the Corinthians had allowed the entire world system in which they existed to infiltrate their assembly. All right, so Bertram, I think I have proven my case that what Paul brought into the church, very evident from this continuation of the problem that Mr. MacArthur identifies as demonic, and yet Paul endorsed it in the Corinthians passages I've just showed you, and he tried to limit it where you had to have a priest-like figure who could interpret it, but that doesn't mean he isn't endorsing it, and John MacArthur is calling it demonic. So what do you think, Bertram? Do you think that this uh, gift of tongues that Paul brought into the church was a good thing? It directly came right out of the Python priestess of the god Apollo and the pagan religion. Why do you think he, the pagan uh, priestess endorsed Paul? So the evidence is stacking up that Paul was endorsed by her because he was a follower of Apollo already. He already had become a paganite, pagan person in this religion. And the mystery he's really uh, uh, disclosed in Acts 26 is he believes that Jesus, his Jesus on that road to Damascus revealed his true identity is as Apollo. And that's quoting from a play where Dionysius, another name for Apollo, according to this cult at Adelphi, that... Uh, in that play of Euripides, that Dionysius used the words, you cannot kick against the pricks, a, a phrase that would only appear in a rhyme, in a meter that would be used in a pagan play. So it definitely was not just using the words abstractly, but used it as a quote out of that play for his Jesus to identify who he really was, was Apollo. But Paul doesn't want to tell you and me who are Christians or have any Jewish background or any of that. He's not going to tell anybody he's an Apollo worshiper, but that's what, exactly what he was. And that's why you had this religion end up with this demonic spirit coming in through glossalia and tongues and all of that. And anyone who's involved in it, I hope this will help free you from it and pray to be released. Pray to God to release you from this demon in your on you and get it out of your life. And the best thing to do that is to get rid of a Paul out of your heart. Just follow Jesus. All right, God bless everybody. Ciao, bye.